You're listening to NapaBroadcasting.com. Thanks for joining us here at Napa Broadcasting. Over the years, a few times each year, we love to invite Bill Chadwick here to talk about his unique military career, about the places he's most recently visited, and some of the fascinating international work he's been doing. It's great to listen to his personal stories, and it gives us a much broader perspective on how the world and Napa coexist. Today, I've invited Bill back to talk about what he's been up to in a whole range of subjects. Bill, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the invitation. Well, it's always great to have you here. One of the things that is a little different, I guess, this time we were talking before we went on the air, is that you're you're semi-retired from uh, some of your military activity. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about that uh, driving over this morning. Um, tomorrow is actually the anniversary of my retirement from the Army. I will have been retired 23 years uh, day after tomorrow. So I, I've been retired almost as long as I was on active duty. But you've still been working for essentially the Department of Defense? Or? Sure, yeah. yeah. I'm, uh, I'm approaching my 20th year to work for the Department of Navy uh, down at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. And talk a little bit about how that work has evolved. When you did it 20 years ago, it's got to be a little bit different than uh, what you've been doing in the past four or five years. Well, as you may recall, the last third of my military career I spent in the Acquisition Corps, which is really uh, about building equipment for Special Operations Forces. Every service has got somebody who's responsible for that. You just don't go out and buy a fighter jet. You don't just go out and buy weapons. You've got to develop the requirement and then... Uh, look for prototypes, build prototypes, field them, test them, and then support the piece of equipment. So that's what I did the last third of my career, and that's what I've been teaching for the last 20 years. And it has changed insofar as technology has just it has, um, improved by leaps and bounds. So keeping up with the technology is a full-time job for a lot of people in Department of Defense. And is there a greater demand around the world for all of this today? There's a greater demand, but at the same time, a lot of militaries are realizing that they really they may not need as much capability as they thought they needed. In fact, Department of Defense, the U.S. Uh, military has discouraged countries from buying a lot of equipment. Uh, I've seen a that that's one key factor I've seen in the last ten years is trying to rely on less technology and more just uh, human ingenuity. And why is that? Why has uh, the department discouraged this? For several reasons. It's because the equipment's become really expensive. The technology isn't always uh, focused on the enemy as much as it is just um, making a soldier, sailor, or airman's job easier. And a lot of countries say that's not important. We don't care about making the job easier for the for the individual military uh, person. We just want to get the job done. And there may be a, a simpler solution. And some of those simpler solutions involve manpower, they involve diplomacy. What do they involve that's different, that's easier? Well, here's an example. Uh, border security is something that can accomplish by putting uh, troops online facing out towards the enemy or the perceived enemy. Mm-hmm. Or you can fly a drone overhead and surveil the same you can build area. build a wall. You can build a <laughs> wall, exactly. There are, less, there are less sophisticated ways to accomplish things. And those less sophisticated ways are being developed by countries that are that have the potential to be more sophisticated, but they're realizing it's a more efficient way to do it. It's a more efficient way, and at the same time, the, US, the, the United States has really cut back a lot on the aid that we offer, as well as uh, foreign military sales. We're giving people less assistance in terms of money to buy equipment from us, and who knows if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But mm-hmm. it's happening. Mm-hmm. We're just seeing the reduction in the budgets. And where can you talk about the countries where this has actually been happening? Well, sure. We f- we shifted our focus in uh, U.S. foreign policy uh, more to the Pacific Rim. We're looking at uh, the capabilities around uh, that border on China. Uh, I've spent considerable time in the last few years Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, um, taking a look at what the capabilities of those countries are and trying to reduce their dependence on U.S. military to, to protect them. And where's next? Where are you headed next? My next trip uh, will be to West Africa, which is another focus for, the, for, the, uh, for U.S. foreign policy. I'm headed to Accra, Ghana. I was in Mauritania my last trip, which is uh, north and west of there. Um, you know, there is a considerable terrorist threat in the western Sahara 
uh, in the Maghreb, which is, it's a, the Maghreb is a, is a separate desert, but it's still all part and parcel of the Sahara. And uh, we've seen a significant terrorist threat uh, coming out of there. So my goal, my, the, what I am sent to do is help militaries figure out what their military equipment requirements are and help them figure out what they're going to purchase or what they're going to build. In most cases, countries in Africa don't develop uh, pieces of equipment from ideas. They buy things that are already on the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has to be fascinating, and we've talked a little bit about this before, but to go to these places to be dealing with all of these things that are taking place around the world, many of which are not in the headlines, many of which people aren't paying much attention to. You have to get to you know, the story, if it appears at all in the New York Times on page 10. To be, to be doing that, to be traveling to these places, to be dealing with this, and then coming back here to little old Napa. I mean, there's, there's got to be a certain cognitive dissonance that enters into that equation. For years and years, I, I suffered from probably what could be described as cultural shock when I would come home. I think I'm inured to that somewhat now uh, as, I, as I get older. I traveled so much in the last 10 years that coming home is just really a relief. It's so nice to be back home. Mm -hmm. I appreciate uh, things so much more when I when I come back home. Uh, but it is you you are right. It is absolutely true that uh, it is a cultural shock to come back home to Napa. Uh, but you know, uh, someone said, um, and and this may be unfair to to uh, our U.S. foreign policy, but wars were created so that Americans had to learn geography. You know. <laughs> Americans really don't travel very much. They tend to stay in the States. They don't see uh, countries overseas and are not aware of what goes on in, in foreign in, lands. Unless they live up valley, and then they don't even tend to come down to Napa. <laughs> They're really limited. <laughs> uh, Although there's a lot to be said for living in Calistoga. I guess, or, or St. Helena, you know. You, they think they have to have a passport to get That's to right. Napa. They That's right. They don't want to leave there. Or certainly a visa. One of the things we were talking about uh, earlier also is the fact that in Africa, in addition to, to what you were talking about, that there's so much Chinese influence there, that the Chinese have been pouring money into Africa for the past 10, 15 years, and, and really their power and influence is pretty substantial today. Easily 15 years. Uh, when I first started traveling to Africa, I started to see uh, – Construction uh, of large, I'm talking about large projects too. We're talking about building uh, um, shopping mall complexes, uh, sports stadiums. Uh, I've seen that to be the case in Rwanda, South Africa, Congo. Um, yeah, it's significant. Zambia, also uh, a lot of construction, and it's all being supported by the Chinese. Now, what they get for that, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's. Uh, if they've been able to tender any of the resources that come out of those countries. Well, I mean, supposedly some of it has been to access natural resources coming out of those countries. Beyond that, it's sphere of it's about sphere of influence. Yeah, I don't know how much I don't know how much uh, sphere of influence you have uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a country where there are 80 million people living. It's the ninth or tenth largest country in the world. It's heavily populated uh, in Kinshasa. I mean, almost 20% of the total country's population live in Kinshasa, and they have five working traffic lights in the whole in the entire city. I don't know what kind of influence they're looking for, but uh, you know, other than the natural resources out in the eastern part of mm -hmm. the Congo near Goma, uh, there's really not a lot to there's not a lot to influence. I guess is my point. Right, and, and but maybe it's it's a longer view. I mean, as we talked about, they have been doing it for a long time, and there has to be some strategic reason for it that goes beyond just the limited natural resources that have come out of it. Yeah, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I tend to think that uh, most most governments probably take a short view of things rather than taking the long view. I don't know what the Chinese strategy is in spending so much uh, investment capital in, in Africa. Uh, I've not seen it bear fruit in terms of their influence. I, I don't see, uh, for example, militaries in Africa buying Chinese equipment. Um, 
They don't wear their uniforms. It, it, it's always fascinating about the Chinese and the long view, you know, about the conversation. When, when, we, when Nixon first opened up China, there was this meeting between Kissinger and Chow and Lai, and they, they were talking about history. And this was a public meeting. Other people got to hear it. And somehow the subject of the French Revolution came up, and Kissinger is asking Chow and Lai his opinion of something about the French Revolution. And Chow and Lai's answer is, well, it's too soon to know. <laughs> Taking the long so view. So that is yeah. the long view. Yeah, totally. Is there any place in the world that you want to go that you haven't been? Um, no, because I've been, I've been, I think I've been everywhere I wanted to go. I've never been to Australia. Uh, never spent any time in Southeast Asia. Uh, those are those are generally uh, countries that we don't support in terms of uh, giving them aid and assistance. Uh, you know. My whole mission is based right. on the foreign military sales uh, construct. Uh, we offer technical support and program management assistance to countries that purchase things that that either purchase things from from commercial firms in America or who are supported by foreign military sales. What is the nexus between what you do and your colleagues do and really the the kind of in mili- the industrial part of the military-industrial complex that manufactures and, and sells the actual equipment? Well, I try to stay abreast of, of new developments in technology. Um, I was in the business. I built uh, IED detectors. I built roadside bomb detectors for uh, commercial firms, so I'm familiar with electronic mm-hmm. technology. Um, because of my military service, I'm familiar with weapon systems and explosives and a lot of the kinetic uh, capabilities that companies produce. I try to stay. I try to stay involved and aware of what's going on. But my goal when I go out is really to be um, the fair witness for a country's requirements development process to give to assist them in finding a, uh, a roadmap to decide wh- what their requirements are, wh- what capabilities and mm-hmm. missions they need to support, and then supporting that with the right equipment. Uh, it it is in fact, and it's not. It was not too too far off uh, last week, or the week before in 1960, when Dwight David Eisenhower made his famous mm-hmm. uh, farewell speech about the military industrial complex. It's it is alive and well in America. We still produce equipment that we don't need, that people don't ask for, um, and unfortunately, that I don't know how to break that that uh, that paradigm. If you ever get to the point that you're not doing this for the Department of Defense, for the Naval War College, if you're not traveling to the same extent, you get tired of it or whatever, how is this, those skills and the things you've been doing, how is that or how might it be applicable to doing stuff in California or in your local community or what have you? I think it would, uh, I think it would translate, and this, would, this is something I would really – uh, enjoy doing, and that's teaching here locally uh, a couple of things. Number one, teaching critical thinking, problem-solving skills, uh, how to get organized and accomplish a mission. I mean, that's what I did for 25 years in the military as a leader. I'd also like to be involved in teaching leadership in, and, and not just as a uh, sterile lecture series, but rather experientially. Um, how would you do that? Well, there are lots of companies out there that do that sort of thing. I used to refer to it as kamikaze organization development. <laughs> you know, you take people out in the woods, uh, similar to what, what we do in Leadership Napa Valley when we did the ropes course. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, Jill Teckle had all of us students jumping from, from log to log out in the woods, uh, learning firsthand what it takes to be a leader and how to build a group, build a team environment, that's what I'd like to do. Mm-hmm. Ideally, I would like to uh, to be some sort of instructor in leadership in, in leadership development as well as uh, how to think. Talk about what's not being done or what you think is not being done in that regard in terms of what kids learn today, what they lack, not only in terms of leadership skills, but in terms of critical thinking and organization. And, and it's sort of life skill aspect of it that that becomes critical but is not really taught in many places. Well, I'll start with what is being taught that I think is really effective. My son attended uh, New Tech High School, 
and you know project-based learning where four people would decide who was going to do what uh, make assignments and you had to pull your load if you didn't pull your load in the four-person team you failed the project and i remember them learning uh they actually studied hamlet that way you know you study english you study uh mathematics as a as a project team we don't do enough of that we ought to do it throughout public school everyone should be working as a part of a team and, and have to pull their load rather than just being responsible for individual work i think one of the things we don't do in public schools is teach problem solving we don't teach critical skill critical learning skills uh, that give the kids the tools they need to figure out do we have a problem if if we have a problem what's the next step and on down the line mm -hmm. How would you think about teaching that to kids today, high school kids, for example? Um, I mean, would you do it in a project-based way? Would you? Uh... Absolutely. I would, I, would, um, I would have kids come into a classroom and sit down. And once they sat down, knowing that they were sitting down next to their friends, I would count them off. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. All the ones moved to the back of the room. All the fours moved to the front of the room. And I would assign kids in groups that they are not comfortable being with. And I would give them half a day just to learn about each other. The afternoon would be spent telling the whole class about the person you just spent an hour learning something about them. I mean, I would take it, my, my feeling has always been you, you learn about yourself, you understand who you are first, then you learn about someone else, and then you start to develop from there. Mm -hmm. It would be a it would be a step-by-step -step process um, Similar to, to what you see in the, in the commercial world with organization development, with right. management consulting skills and those kinds of activities they do. And is that still very much a part of training in the military today? It really isn't. It, it is more so than it was when I was on active duty. In mm -hmm. fact, I spent, I spent a couple of years as a management consultant. The Army had a school at Fort Ord back in the 1970s and 80s, and I attended the school taught me the skills uh, to be a management consultant. I've used them ever since the 1980s, applying those skills of learning about myself, learning to be part of a group, figuring out you know, our collective mission and de determining a plan to accomplish that mission. I think the Army is much better. The Army has been involved in wars, and when I say the Army, I'm talking about the military service mm -hmm. in general, has been very proactive in teaching people skills, the life skills to be a, a better team member, better group member. And there's a lot of talk about that lately with respect to, to veterans and, and those that, that coming back from service. To what extent do you see that as a lot of chatter or actually something that's, that's constructive, that's useful? Well, first of all, there's a lot of chatter about letting women into combat roles. And there has been a lot of resistance on the part of Many of my colleagues don't feel it's appropriate that women should not be allowed to be in the combat arms, in infantry, in the field artillery, in armor, special forces fields. Um, I feel strongly that they should be. I, th I think we ought to integrate both genders, all genders, into military service. This, this transgender ban that just went back into effect, uh, I think is deleterious to good order. I think it's a mistake. I think we should allow anyone who wants to serve, we should make the accommodation so that everyone can serve. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that it's bad, the ban? Why do you think that it's deleterious, as you say? Um, well, first of all, uh, sex, sexual orientation, uh, bodily function should not be part of our decision making when we decide who's going to defend our nation. That's why it's bad. That's why the ban is the ban is artificial. Right. That's that's my that's my most basic feeling is it's the same it's for the same reason in 1948 when we segregated when we integrated the armed services. Why had they been segregated? Why did we make African Americans enlisted men but they had to be officered by white officers? Right. What what was that all about? I mean, what's amazing is that that the military was one of the first really big institutions to integrate. It really was at the cutting edge. I found out something last night that was really disturbing to me, too. I, I have a complete uh, record of all the Medal of Honor recipients since its in, in inception. And there were 20 men who received the Medal of Honor at Wounded Knee. Now, I think we've pretty much decided the Wounded Knee was a massacre. 
It was not a battle. There was no pitched fighting. Some of the citations read that these men performed honorably, that they fought against uh, um, the Native American uh, warriors. There were very few warriors in that, in that camp. And, and 20 men got the Medal of Honor for their service that day on the 29th of hmm. November, 1890. Uh, so many years later, there is a movement in America to, to take away their, their uh, Medal of Honor uh, um, awards. I think, uh, you wow. know, the decisions we make and the things that, that pass for good judgment uh, are always in question. And you think the military today is, is better run, as better organizationally than it has been in some time? I think so. I think it had to be. I think that uh, just because we were close to combat for so many years, it had to get better. Hmm. Uh, I, don't th- I, don't, I have not seen my contemporaries uh, talk about careerism like we did you know, 40, 50 years ago. I think it's a much better military. I certainly um, was sorry to see Jim Mattis leave as the Secretary of Defense. Right. He seemed like a, a, a super trooper and a, and a really squared away person. And seemed to be very popular among, yes. Uh, yes, he among was very everybody popular. in the military. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, well, we'll see where all of that leads. <laughs> it's troubled times in that regard. Well, we have a senior, we have a former senior vice president for Boeing now running the department. We really do have the military-industrial complex. That really brings it right into focus exactly. to what Eisenhower was talking about all exactly. those years ago. Yeah. So when do you leave again? I don't leave until the end of February. So I've got a. In fact, I just got the notice today to start my my teaching materials together. So. And is it pretty much the same materials each time? They are. We take a look at. We, we get a lot of background information on the country we're going to. I study what their current procurement rules say. Uh, a lot of countries around the world don't have that kind of information posted on a website. Right. Many militaries uh, don't share the information about what they're purchasing or what their military uh, requirements are. We'll look forward to hearing about this trip when you come back. Sure thing, Jeff. All right. Bill Chadwick, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you.